And when I saw it, I was like, what the hell is this all? This seems like fun. Well, I wish I'd have known you at the time. I could have, I, I, I probably could have swung something for you. Well, I'll put that in my pocket for later. <laughs> Welcome to Story and Craft. Now, here's your host, Mark Preston. Hey, how are you? Welcome back. This is Story and Craft. I'm Mark Preston. Uh, if this is episode number two, well, this is episode number two, but if you're coming in and checking out your second episode, thank you for coming back. If you are new to the show, thank you for checking this out. Glad to have you here. Uh, today, Billy Burke, what a great actor. One of those guys you see show up in a movie uh, or in a TV show, you know he's going to deliver. Uh, he's just uh, one of my favorite working actors out there. Great conversation. Uh, Billy has been in a multitude of shows, going to 24. Uh, we talk about that. He's also been in shows like Revolution and Zoo. Of course, to uh, many, he's known as Bella Swan's father, Charlie, in Twilight. Most recently, he's been on Made, uh, also been on 911 Lone Star. So we had a great conversation, and I'm glad uh, you're here to check it out. Hey, don't forget to uh, check us out, storyandcraftpod.com. Once again, head over to storyandcraftpod.com. Got all the social media links on there. Uh, also, a way for you to leave a voicemail. Kind of cool. A way for you to get involved in the show. And by the way, favor to ask. Please follow, like the show, give us a review, Apple Podcasts, and we're on whatever podcast app you've got that you like. Okay, so let's get after it. It's Billy Burke Day right here on Story and Craft. How are you, my friend? I'm good. How are you? I'm really uh, sorry about the... Several times we've tried to do this. Hey, we've eventually landed here. It's all right. Now, where are you located? Are you on the um, East Coast or West Coast? I am. I'm in New York now. I just uh, just moved back here in August, as a matter of fact. So You're from uh, Washington originally, right? Yes. Uh, I grew up uh, in Bellingham, Washington, which is just you know south of the Canadian border and... And then spent some formative years in downtown Seattle, and then uh, moved to LA, which you know, which was my base for the past uh, better part of thirty years. Well, you were, when you were in LA, uh, I'm sorry, when you were in Seattle, that's that that was. Are we talking right about the height? Because I noticed all the guitars behind you. I'm wondering if that's the height <laughs> of the grunge phase. If we're... It was so right in the middle of all of that. Um, yeah, it was. I, I had a band in um, high school and uh, continued to play music from there on out. And so moved to downtown Seattle when I was 17 and, and immediately really? started a band there. Yeah. And, and so I was, you know, I was playing out uh, with my, several versions of my band during that whole, that whole thing. And you know, knew a lot of the people who, uh, uh, you know, burgeoned from that. And we actually, we shared a rehearsal space with Alice in Chains at one time before they were called Alice in Chains. And, and anyway, so I realized and I saw, um, what was happening, what was bubbling up at that time musically. And we weren't doing anything like that at all. What was in the water in Seattle from about 88 to the to early 90s, what was in the water? It was just, you know, actually, I think that it had something to do with, because uh, I had started working in radio when I was 17 uh, in Dallas. And I remember I was there during the height of the kind of the boy band, New Kids on the Block and all that. The grunge, mm -hmm. I think, was just it was just a reaction <laughs> to all that. It was a little bit of a backlash, kind of. I yeah, I, I think it was probably a combination of a lot of things, um, uh, not the least of which, you know, when something starts bubbling in a city like that, it, at least it, it had been historically like, you know, Athens, Georgia, you know, how they had their big boom. And, and I think Seattle was just kind of sort of destined for that. And then, uh, yeah, something about that entire, you know, mood and movement spoke to, you know, the masses and it just went crazy there was something cool happening in the early 90s i think there really was it was good times and you're still doing it you're still uh you're still doing the music uh, the musical thing are you, are you do you have a band right now or are you uh <laughs> here's what i do i you know 
perhaps my uh, my ideal first plan would have been to uh, be come successful in the uh, in the music world first and then you know sort of push my way into the film and tv business from there i i had always planned on having a, some sort of dual career but uh you know the the movies and tv started to kind of pick i moved to la in 91 or 92 um and that started to pick up first and i just kind of went with that and so now I just write music, record music for my my own enjoyment. Well, isn't that kind of sort of where the genesis of all of it should start? Is write the music, play the music you like, you know, and then you'll find yeah. and the and the people find you will dig in, you know. Now I know uh, Billy Bob Thornton was one of those guys, kind of did that good kind of riding those two rails thing, you know, both music and. Mm-hmm. Uh, the film thing, but I will say I've tried to hunt it down. I can't seem to rummage it up. But Dill Scallion, uh, I did a. I, I don't like to do a whole lot of research, research. But I was like, okay, let me just take a look. IMDb. I was like, wait a minute, this is you actually playing a country music singer. And how that was that your first official theatrical project that you did? Uh, the, it was, no. it was a, like a mockumentary, right? It was a mockumentary. Yeah, uh, that was by no means my first thing. Um, however. It was my first, uh, it was my first, you know, lead in a movie. Um, I'd done a ton of stuff before that that didn't get recognized. I, uh, um, a couple of movies, you know, I did a couple of independents while still in Seattle. Um, and so before Dill Scallion, uh, there was, uh, I did Without Limits, which was written and directed by Robert Town, um, starring Crudup. Uh, and then I did this other comedy which was made by the people who do uh airplane called mafia which was with the zucker yeah the right, that yeah. team yeah um and it was you know it was a spoof on the mafia um and right after that because that was a comedy um uh this this guy jordan brady who you know still a friend to this day he uh came to me and said would you be interested in doing this? We'd take a look at this. And I just read the script and laughed out loud and thought it was uh, beautiful. And it, to this day, one of the greater experiences I've ever had doing anything. I mean, we, I mean, the we cast got a, was kind of the, one of the more unique cast. I mean, you had Henry Winkler, you had yeah. Willie Nelson, Pete Berg, you know? Yeah. Lauren Graham, um, uh, David Keckner, who's one of the funniest people on the planet who, uh, you know, yeah it was a kind of a magical little cast and we just threw it together i mean none of the songs were written we uh, got on a tour bus in la and and wrote the songs kind of as we went um and the plan was to just shoot everything we could you know some scripted some not uh all the way to nashville on this uh, tour bus so you can imagine it whatever i was to, to, 29 30 years old it was uh it was it was a great time <laughs> all you have to say is tour bus i'm thinking yeah, okay mm-hmm. this was a good this was a good time you know so it gave me it gave me a little bit of you know what i thought i should have had back in that day well apparently pete berg liked the experience I mean, he brought you back to do uh, uh wonderland uh yeah. he, he was didn't he, he directed wonderland right or what he was? He, what, did he also act in it? I think, if a he, memory serves, he wrote it. Uh, he wrote it, produced it, and directed the pilot and uh, several episodes afterwards. But, but yeah, it would, and you know, it was the first pilot that I had done that had actually got on the air. I had done, I don't know, maybe six, seven, eight pilots before that got on the air. Um, and that was the first time I'd lived in New York as well. So, uh, and we shot it here in New York, but, and it was huge off the bat. I mean, the, the, the numbers that they got back then were nothing comparable to what, uh, what we see today. I mean, we opened with massive numbers. It was, you know, it was a big splash right off the bat. And then I, I don't know what happened. The network got scared and, uh, somebody got fired and, uh, and the baby went out with the bathwater on that. But it was a real I mean, it's a it's a show that would probably still hold up today. It was really ahead of its time. Yeah, you know, it's funny that you, you mentioned the thing uh, when you did the pilot. I have a lot of friends who uh, 
they're they're always just cranking on pilot season. There's this one thing after the other. It's got to be the biggest one of the biggest emotional roller coasters. You go and it looks like it's going to go. It's go and it get get to the end. Yep. Nope, not going to happen. You know. Yeah, it's uh, this business is not for the faint hearted. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> I mean that is that is how it goes, and I I think all said and done, pilot wise, um, I think somebody had told me that that George Clooney had done you know eleven or twelve. Well, by the mid two thousands, I'd done thirteen. Um, so and pilot season today doesn't really exist as it used to. Well, we don't really run in seasons quite the way. I mean, it was always like fall, big release. Now it's just they're releasing all throughout the year. So we're kind of like, you're never really stopping now. You know, it seems like there's always something in production. Yeah, you know? There's always something in production. Um, networks uh, don't operate the way that they, they used to. Uh, there's way too big a landscape now with uh, so many streaming services and so much competition for people's eyeballs that uh, it, yeah, it can't work the same way. But there's, I, I think there are st- still some vestiges of uh, of pilots being made. But usually, it's like here's the idea, here's who's attached. It either goes straight to series or it doesn't. Yeah. You know, one one of the things I've always admired about you, Matt, the eclectic choices. It's all about making choices. But in terms of career, though, you've landed in a, like a really nice eclectic mix of shows. Is it just sort of like just. You know, just, you know, happenstance happened to land you there? Or were you actively going, you know, I, this is something I really want to, you know, do right that now? Is, that is mostly luck. I mean, unless you get immediately on a, on a fast track that's going to take you to a place where you have um, a multitude of choices, it's, it's, mostly, it's mostly luck. You, uh, you know, you kind of... Uh, at some point in time, you kind of resign yourself to what is going to come your way. There are things that you, you know, that once in a while you can hear about and really sort of go after and make a play for. Um, but the competition for those things is immense. And, you know, you're you're fighting bigger names all the time. And uh, that's just, it's just the way it goes. You know? you know, the things you've landed in have always been like I said, it's very memorable. You know, one of, in fact, the kids. My, I have three teenagers. Uh, one just started college uh, this year, and but when COVID first kicked off, I mean, they're home, and we're all just like, okay, well, how are we going to be managing this? So it's of course online school. It's and been really fun, we, hasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's been an adventure, you know, and I, I'm lucky I got three kids who are smarter than me and they just managed it beautifully. But uh, it was an opportunity to kind of do that, uh, those shows that were out when they were a little bit too young. I got a, uh, uh, I've got an 18, almost, gosh, she's almost 19, uh, 19, uh, 17 year old son. My youngest daughter is 16. And so what we did was like, what can we binge? So we went through Lost, which is kind of a, kind of a head trip of a show to, to, to power through, you know, but we also caught up at 24 twice, you know, it was one of my, I thought, I thought it was just a fun, great series. Um, and you've literally done so much. I like pop. I'm like, Oh yeah, Billy Burke. He, he was right. He was in this episode. And that one of my favorite things about that, uh, spin was, was, um, I was talking to somebody about this the other day. Some of my favorite roles, some of my favorite people to watch are, are ones that you watch, even when they don't have dialogue. Cause you're wondering, okay, what are they going to do? What are they thinking? You know? And mm-hmm. that, that character in 24 was, uh, he was a gnarly cat, but you didn't quite put it together. I mean, that was how, how do, I'm curious how that one <laughs> role came together. Cause I'm a little bit of a 24 nerd. I'm going I'm to put it out All there. Right. Mike, you know, how did that, how did that come together for you? <sighs> I don't really remember clearly. It was kind of in the thick of um, some other stuff going on, and I don't really uh, remind me if you can what it, what year that even was, so I could. Put I think it I think to, I got. Uh, I wrote. I made a little note because I know it's two thousand two to uh, two thousand three, which makes me realize that was doesn't long seem like twenty years ago. <laughs> <laughs> you know, getting to that age, like, wait a minute, that's. That's, that's twenty years, man. Okay, so, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that I mean, I know you 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 were busy and things were ramping up nicely for you. But I talked to uh, Reed Diamond, uh, and I, I'm I'm always mm-hmm. curious about the experience of shooting that show. It was just really fast. Was it just it, what was the experience like shooting twenty four? Um, well, first of all, they, by the time I got there, they had their machine down. I mean, mm-hmm. they were they were clicking real well and. Um, just a really 
great atmosphere and you know uh when you when you there's big differences between working on shows that have certain successes and, and shows that you know may just kind of be meandering out there in the atmosphere but um but 24 was clicking by then and i don't really remember how it came about but uh but i think that john kazar one of the creators um i think i met with him and and he sort of told me a little bit about the scope of the character and and the arc and what it was going to do and sounded sounded great to me and uh and so we just kind of dove in but the (laughs) the story that i would tell about that is not that you're necessarily looking for stories but i'm gonna (laughs) um, i'm not gonna turn you down please feed (laughs) but um so what happened was, is we shot all my episodes and on the very last one, I got the script. Um, and it said something along the lines of he goes searching through his, he's in a big rush and he's panicked and he's going searching through his house for something, blah, blah, blah. And he lifts up a lamp or something like that and finds his stash of, I guess what we assume is meth. <laughs> so... Um, unbeknownst to me, I, uh, I apparent, my character was apparently on meth the whole time and I didn't really know it. <laughs> really? That's yeah. okay. I need to go yeah. rewatch this now. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> <I know>. okay. <laughs> it's kind of like behind the music, but behind 24. <laughs> uh, I always wonder what it's like to shoot that show because there's so much going on. You have, um, you know, it, it just, it, it, it was a show that. Uh, I think kind of at the time it was post nine eleven. It was just primed, and I know uh, Kiefer mm-hmm. Sutherland's talked about. It. It's like if they come up, can come up with a new script. I'm like, maybe they focus on domestic terrorism now. God, I, I don't know, but but it was definitely you kind of saw the impetus of how that thing took off in the early two thousands, and it just was one of those shows you don't know if they could really do a show like. Or I don't mean the subject matter, but a show that just take off and just catches on fire and runs for that many seasons. You know, if something gets three seasons nowadays, that seems like a long time, you know. It's, it is, it is, and has always been, and will probably continue to be lightning in a bottle. I mean, you, you just, you're, you're putting the best stuff out there that you possibly can and, and hoping that, that people get curious and interested about it. My, my storyline on that show, um, happened to be, you know, one of the B or even C storylines. Um, so I didn't really, there wasn't, I didn't experience what, uh, most of them experienced on the show with the, with the big stuff going on and the, you know, um, I was, uh, which I was totally fine with it, by the way. I was, yeah. I think most of the scenes yeah. were pretty contained a couple, probably a couple, three locations at the most, like at a house, I think, yeah. you know, so yeah. not a, you weren't as I remember it. I'm, I, 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 I feel like I was pretty much just uh, chasing Alicia Cuthbert around the whole time. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> well, she's yeah. cute. You know, I understand. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but no, they, <laughs> you, you've had such a resume and done so many things. It's like, okay, you know, you've had a chance to work with, I mean, um, got Anthony Hopkins. I mean, that's, that's right there. It's like, you know, it it doesn't get a whole lot better than that, right? I mean, in terms of uh, company to be in, right? Yeah, indeed, I indeed. Mean, and in that movie that you're speaking of, that's that's Hopkins and uh, and Gosling all in the same shot. So yeah, yeah. I think that, that had to have been pretty soon after. It was the the Notebook? I think it was. He was still you know, Ryan Gosling was still kind of on fire with that. I think so. Yeah. Uh, well, he was he was catching big fire at that time. There's no question about it. Um, and you know, I you you can tell when you work with people that you know. There's there's sometimes where you can sort of sense a trajectory that's that's going to happen, um, and that was always pretty obvious uh, with with him. And he was, you know, despite all that, just a really solid guy. Yeah, plus he's Canadian, yeah. so he's you know real friendly naturally. You know, the um, Canadians. You know? Indeed, indeed. Now, the uh, now all along while you're doing this, is music still part of your ecosystem, part of the thing you're doing, or is that, or was it? I don't. Wanna, I'm not saying shelved. Uh, was it put on pause a little bit while you were focusing on what was going on at the time? 
it's been something that I have never not paid attention to. It is just one of those things that you know, a lot of people talk about uh, the things that, you know, keep them sane or keep them grounded. Uh, I, I suppose if, because I have no better terminology for it, that would probably be, that probably be it. I, I, I do it cause it's there, you know, it's uh, I, I'm constantly writing songs. I'm constantly writing a lot of stuff. Um, now, are you but, sticking to one particular genre, or are you kind of, or just whatever kind of no, hits you at the moment? As a matter of fact, so the 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 two you know self made albums that I've that I've actually released uh, that are both on Spotify. One was kind of a collection of everything that I had built up while I was uh, getting caught up in movies and TV, um, and then years went by and then I decided I wanted to make, you know, a rock album that kind of, uh, paid some tribute to the stuff that I grew up with. Um, so I put that one out and, uh, now I'm doing one that is inspired by, uh, a lot of the country influence stuff that, uh, I've always appreciated. So that's what, that's what's in the can. Yeah, my my daughter now, my youngest is just out of the blue. You know, I, I was getting a new, my uh, my needed to get a new vehicle, and my daughter's. Like, I want you to get a pickup truck. I was like, pickup truck. You know, she's as, she's as much of a city girl as they come. And the next thing you know, I get the pickup, and because like, that's made sense to me. You know, I'm from Dallas originally. Got to have a pickup. You know, you can't go wrong with one. No, you know, now she's like, let's listen to country music. I was like, you like country? I was like, yeah. And uh, and she said, we're driving, and she's like, daddy. Did they have like country music when you're younger? I'm like, oh, baby, bless your heart. I was like, <laughs> and so I said, okay, now I'm realizing I am, I got Spotify on the phone plugged into the car, and I'm like, I'm gonna go and educate you a little bit. I said, tell you what, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a sample of high school, college, Brooks and Dunn, uh, Neon Moon. I kick it on. She starts ah, singing it. Dude, I cover that song. I love it. <laughs> yeah, and like this bullish, she starts singing the song. Baby, how the hell do you know this song? She's like, it's TikTok. I'm, <laughs> Apparently somebody's yeah. singing the song in TikTok, but uh, so we, we went through and just, it's, it's just kind of funny. She just, she, she enjoys, it. I haven't quite gone into the whole Willie thing. I mean, that's gotta be part of her uh, education. So many songs have, I mean, through my daughter as well, my daughter's 13 and there are so many songs from my youth and, you know, early adulthood that she knows every word to now. Um, that she shouldn't, but she does. And, and, and that is due to TikTok. So I guess uh, no matter how you feel about it, there's one good thing about it. I talked to my old radio buddies. I'm like, man, what in the world would people listen to now? Kids, uh, you know, uh, the impressionable age and make them think, God, I want to do that radio thing. You know, back when we were young, there was the music, there was the personality, but it was that's how kids discovered music. We all had the boom box with a tape ready to go at a moment's notice to record that mixtape. Uh, but they're all discovering on Spotify, and in a way that almost opens up a whole other world for them. You know, on demand, they can listen to anything. Yeah, it's it's great for music lovers and appreciators uh, and for the perpetuation of, of music itself, but has yet to really come to a place for musicians and bands and people who you know, that's, that's, that's a tough one. I mean, yeah, my business is, is tough. I'm glad I don't have to make a, a living as a, a musician. It's, that's a weird, weird landscape. Yeah. Now, the, now they, they used to yeah. be the, 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 especially on the first album, I remember the album, the folks got to get out on tour and make their money. And then now I think record labels do that all around deal where they get a piece of the tour also. So, you know, if you got it used to be, you don't make your money until you get to your second album. Hopefully you get a second album. Right. And then your second album usually sucks because uh, <laughs> that's the, the sophomore slump that everybody expects. Yeah. yeah. So what were you listening to? You mentioned something about your musical inspirations, and that's kind of what feed has and fed into what your choices on writing and performing. But what were you listening to back uh, back in the day? In well, in which day? Well, I mean, when, when you were coming up as a teenager, like what I want to say, the word influence is what you heard. Like, damn, I, you just want to go pick up a guitar, even if you didn't know how to play. You just wanted to kind of, you were just like jazzed by it. Yeah. Well, the stuff I grew up with, the stuff that made me interested in music was um, 
uh, the songwriters, you know, I would listen to my, I'm sure this is the case with a lot of people, but I would listen to my mom's music and my dad's music, um, that was constantly playing around the house. And so it was, it was the, the James Taylors and the Jim Croce's. And, uh, when the first time I heard, uh, you know, songs, you know, the deeper cuts by Elton John that Bernie Toppin wrote with him. Oh yeah. Like that's what I was really, I was really into this, that sort of, uh, amalgamation of, uh, of words and music together. But I was always pretty heavily bent towards the more melodic than the more, uh, experimental. I mm -hmm. appreciate the experimental, but I like a song that, you know, that, sticks to your gut and you can't stop singing after you hear it, you know, or somebody just mentions the name of the song and it starts playing in your head immediately. Yeah. And I've noticed that my daughter, my daughter actually has that sort of way better than I did. My, my daughter can hear a song one time and she knows the entire chorus. I don't know how that happens, but, uh, good is she her. playing instruments right now? Or are you, uh, is she she is, play? she's, she's um she's becoming a pretty decent drummer um that seems to be the one that she is sort of you know leaning towards most she plays a little bit of guitar um and she sings um has yet to uh sort of you know really find she's a good singer but she has yet to find where her voice really lives yet so uh, I'm hoping that once that happens, she uh, comes out and, you know, explodes with something. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I was listening to a podcast and a pen, uh, Gillette was on it. And he was talking about his daughter, uh, Moxie Crime Fighter. I'm like, well, that's one hell of a bad name. Isn't that an name. awesome name? <laughs> and then, awesome. and then I ran across the name that you blessed your child with, uh, Bluesy LaRue. I'm like, uh, you just, you, mm -hmm. you've, you've birthed a rock star just out of the gate right there. That name is as ready for an album cover, you know? Well, it could be a rock star. It could go a lot of different ways, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, that uh, another that's another thing that just kind of came out of the ether. Um, wanted you know something uh, something musical um, and something that you know s said something. So the name Blue was played around with, and then uh, we landed on Bluesy. And I said uh, I said to her mother at the time, I said. Uh, if it's going to be bluesy, she's got to have a sing songy middle name. And her, the, this all credit to her, the first, first one out of her mouth was LaRue. And I just went, done. Yeah. And it crosses all genres, I can imagine uh, rock, country, yeah. blue, you know. She's kind of at that age now. Now you have a teenager, you know, as my people say, Mazel Tov, welcome to the teens. Um, <laughs> how is that? How is that? She, how's she looking at dad doing the music thing, doing the acting thing? Is she, is she enamored by, like, that's really cool? Or is she just like, you know, whatever about uh, her dad doing this thing. I think because we're living in the times we live in and she's 13 years old, that she is much more influenced by um, what's going on uh, in her atmosphere than she is by, by this. Now she recognizes what this is. She grew up on sets. She, you know, she's traveled tons she's got more on her passport uh she had more on her passport at 10 years old than i had by the time i was 30 um so she's she's lived in that world but in terms of i mean and she does appreciate uh you know the fact that uh, i've had some success in in this business but she's not seen almost any of it <laughs> really I mean, she, no she's 13 she still hasn't seen the twilight movies so. I, was, I was just about to say you know what's really wild is i i know um ian summerhalder's uh, sister and i was talking with her and i said you know it's so funny that uh my daughter uh, emma my, my 16 year old has a friend who has a picture of her brother it's a blanket, but it's got a picture of her brother on it. I'm like going, I said, isn't that the weirdest thing? I said, wait a minute. I'm doing the the math on this. I was like, you know, uh, Vampire Diaries was a little while back. 
And from what I gather, kids, uh, the, this teenage group is starting to discover a lot of that stuff. And they're starting to rediscover Twilight. Have you noticed that at all? Like with your daughter and uh, her, her tribe, have you noticed that like a Twilight's kind of coming into their like ecosystem now? Have you, has that happened? Yeah, it never really went away. <laughs> it's always been hovering there on, in the sort of uh, in the mist underneath. Um, but yes, just very recently in the past year, I mean, Twilight had some sort of uh, resurgence on on Netflix or one of the streamers, um, and but it was never because of the juggernaut that that whole series was. It was it. it it was never really not present. I mean, people sort of just kind of found out that, you know, the, the guy who played Charlie Swan was her dad. And so there's always been trickles of that everywhere, but yeah, now in high school, it, it, it's, it's, I just, I try to make it the least big a deal that can possibly be. And she goes with that. So I'm happy for that. Yeah. When that screenplay landed in your lap and you're looking at it, did you, it's like a two part question. Did you get what it was supposed to be about out of the gate or, and did you also kind of say, okay, this is going to be something This is going to turn into something. You, did you have a sense of that or did you kind of look at it like, okay, it's going to be a job I'm going to knock out here and, what was at first blush? What was your vibe on it? Uh, first of all, I didn't get the whole screenplay. Um, I had no idea of uh, what the book series was. I had never heard of it. Um, I went in to meet Catherine Hardwick, the director of the of the first movie, and we talked a little bit, and then we we sort of read through a couple of scenes. Um, and as I was leaving, she said, she said, how do you feel about this? And I'm like, I'm like, I don't know. I haven't read the whole script. I guess I, I, and she said, go home and Google twilight. And so I did. And then I, I was like, oh, this is a, it's a big deal. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I think, I mean, I don't know. I've heard, of course, a lot of the other, uh, participants and actors talk about their experience on the movies and whether or not they thought it was going to hit like it did. I think I'm the only one who kind of knew mm -hmm. I'm the only one who ad admits it anyway. I kind of knew I, I looked at it and like, this is just, it's a recipe for absolute success. There's no way this is not going to speak to, to its audience. The, the adults quote unquote adults where they hanging out together and the kids were hanging out together. Uh, and I, you know, I, I haven't seen the full series. I've seen, I think one or two of the movies. Me and but... Facinelli were the only adults. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, with the exception of, I mean, Elizabeth Reeser and, and, um, and some others were there as well, but the rest of the, you know, the rest of the cast was somewhere between a 18 and 25. And, um, so there really was no, uh, everybody hung out with everybody when we were on set. And if you felt like hanging out uh, off the set, uh, you may or may not. And, you know, I most of the time kind of keep to myself anyway. So, yeah. yeah it's so funny that the kids, um, my kids grow up in this era where they have these movies uh, based off books or what. You know, they're great movies. Don't get me wrong. It's just I'm remembering, I'm hitting rewind. And I remember back right about the uh, John Hughes movies, the Brat Pack times. And it was kind of when most movies were really crafted for adults up to that point. You know, you really didn't have teen-driven movies for the most part. And then all, then all these movies started popping out. Like, And, of course, you had a chance. Uh, you spent some time with Rob Lowe, you know. And uh, <laughs> that has to be kind of interesting because he was, you know, there was a time when the, 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 you had, like, that whole Brat Pack thing, that's what I grew up on. And there wasn't any, I don't think there were really any sci-fi or kind of movies like that out there. So this is a, I don't know, it's, it's, it's kind of cool. It's a little different. It's kind of neat to kind of live vicariously through my kids as they experience these movies, you know? Yeah. I think, I, as far as I can tell, I mean, the Harry Potter series really started that entire uh, movement of like, oh, if we can get a hold of a of something that can become this kind of franchise, then then that's probably the way to go. That's, you know, 
and that's where we live today. I mean, Marvel rules the world, you know? Hey, as an actor, that that's some job security, too. I mean, I, I remember when I was working at ABC years ago, and I was interviewing somebody. I think it was inter- In fact, I was interviewing John Favreau uh, when he did a movie called PCU. I mean, we're going way back. Oh, I sort of remember that. I don't remember seeing it, but I sort of remember that movie. Yeah, yeah. he played a character called Gutter, who was the kind of stoner guy at a, a university. It was back, this was politically correct university. It was Jeremy right. Piven played kind of the... You know, the the main dude, uh, but he said, "Listen," he said, "You know, whenever a show wraps, I'm out of work." Technically, I was like, and, and just kind of just registers. Oh yeah, until you get another gig, you're out of work. You know, so these kind of movies that you know you're going to get two or three films out of that's that's some security. That must be kind of nice. Yeah, and even then, you don't know. I mean, I like I said, I I I was pretty sure that the first film would have some success, but. Uh, you know, do you know that it's going to have the kind of success that is definitely going to catapult it into the making the rest of the of the movies? You don't know that. It, 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 yeah, because you, you don't have a, that crystal ball, certainly. If you look at kind of the arc of, you know, you've done the films, you've done TV. Is there any preference in your mind on the workflow? Like, OK, TV, I can stay close to home. I, you know, do you have a preference? I. I have a tendency to. On the whole, I have a tendency to uh, get more involved probably than anybody would prefer me to when it comes to the content and the writing and the actual what we put on film or uh, digital image. Um, So indie films were always like a, a playground. You know, whenever an indie film would come along, it would be just even if it was not a great script, it would, it would be a place where you could kind of do stuff that, uh, wasn't on the page, you know? And then there are places that are very stringent, stringent and, uh, where the work environment is very like, this is, this is what we do. And these are the rules on this show. And, you know, I don't get along very, very well with rules. And (laughs) so it was, uh, like, kind of like, um, Oh God! It did West Wing. Um, I, I'm vapor locking yeah. on the uh, yeah. good example. Yeah, yeah it's just because the, the, every word is there for a reason. It carries its own weight, and you gotta, you know. And for what it is, it works. I mean, that's Aaron, Sor- Aaron Sorkin works that way. Yeah, you you like being able to kind of float in the moment and kind of riff a little bit. You know, is that kind of the way you prefer to to work usually? I. <sighs> I have to be able to, I got to be able to, um, cause the words that are on the page are, are there and they're, they're there for a reason to, you know, uh, show you who the character is and move the plot along and stuff like that. But, but I gotta be able to work with them and massage them a little bit. Um, otherwise it feels really uncomfortable and false and I, I just don't like it. I've never been in an, uh, I've never had to work in an environment that's apparently that strict. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I've never worked on a Sorkin show, but there are, I know that there are places like that where it's very important that every word is the word. Um, I don't know how I would get along in that. Um, uh, I, I suppose if, you know, if one is doing Shakespeare, one has to sort of stick to the text. But uh, I, I, I don't know how this guy works in that environment. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's almost like music, you know, it's kind of jazz. You got to, you know, kind of riff it a little is. bit. Um, yeah. Now, I know my son and I, back when he's 17, now back when he was seven, eight years old or so, he, we we got really into Revolution. He loved that show. Uh, so we, uh, we dug it. And that's one of those shows I'm like, man, I, uh, well, that's... Uh, that audience seemed to be pretty big on that show, by the, by the way. I mean, it was like, you know, it was, it was preteen to teen boys that really dug that show. And then, mm-hmm. and then it jumped to like an older crowd from there in terms of demo. Um, 
but it doesn't surprise me that the, your seven year old at that time was was into it. Yeah. Speaking of John Favreau, that was, it was didn't wasn't J.J. Abrams involved in that as well? He was. He was the exact producer on that. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was just kind of a fun. It was one of the shows like ah, I wanted a few more seasons out of it, but uh, you know, it's like that thing. It's like <laughs> we did too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you got those shows out there that are um, I think sci fi ish stuff seems to be the one thing. It's it's it's. A little more finicky. There are a lot of great shows that seem to end a season or two too early, but they were sci-fi yeah. based, you know. But that was definitely one. I enjoyed it. In fact, I was uh, I auditioned at least a couple, three times for Zoo, and when I I would like I only got pieces of the script, and I was like, I didn't. Hang fully on a under- second. What? <laughs> when did you do this? Oh, uh, uh, back in was it 2050 oh i'd be like a day player i wasn't i wasn't doing anything uh, uh certainly i wouldn't be a regular were you living in in new orleans or Vancouver? yeah i'm here right now in fact yeah in new orleans and uh oh so yeah that's uh that so, totally makes sense okay <laughs> oh i show up in all kinds of random stuff shot here but uh but no i know in fact i have a friend of mine terry weibel acted with i think a couple few times on that show and she said oh, he's so sweet he's so nice he's such a nice guy you know so i was like oh. well she's a liar <laughs> you know she she's 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 diplomatic <laughs> uh it was funny that uh, when i got this i couldn't quite get my head around what is this supposed to be because even if you're a day player week player you're really not getting uh, the full scope of what's going on. And when I saw it, I was like, what the hell is this all? This seems like fun. Um, I think I did a call back, and I was about as far as I got with that. Well, I wish I'd have known you at the time. I could have, I, I probably could have swung something for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll put that in my pocket for later. Next time you're in New Orleans. <laughs> it's it's worth a mufflata, maybe some beignets for you, something I'll throw throw a little lanyap yeah. your way. A little, uh, little uh, lanyap, I was about to say, too. So, yeah, the we didn't either, if this is where your question is going. We didn't... Uh, Week to week, script to script, we didn't have a clue what was about to happen either. I mean, it, it's, and I'm sure you hear this all the time from actors uh, on television shows that you just, you, you get scripts and you go, oh, that? That's what we're doing? Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> just, <laughs> oh, this is the ride we're taking now. All right. Yeah. Okay. But it was it was a it was a very cool idea, and it's it's I see I sometimes wonder and when I watch shows going okay, would that show a couple of years later have more of an opportunity to take off because it, just whatever reason is it you know did it find the right time and I just thought it was a, such a cool idea. Yeah, right. I've seen some shows since then, as a matter of fact, that um, that made me kind of think for a second, like, well, had we done that and been there in you know, in the time that we're in right now and uh, had that been acceptable and perhaps had the show not been on a, uh, a network, right. um, um, we'd have been able to get away with some things that would have made it, you know, what it could have been. Um, you know, I think as a streamer, that would do really well. Yeah. As a network show, it did as well as as it could, I, I think, on a network, you know, selling commercial television time. Um, but in order to do what what I and probably a lot of other people thought it could have done without those restraints, um, it yeah, it could have gone a, a lot of really cool places. I think that's kind of – I was talking to a director the other day, uh, Ariel Vroman, and we were talking about the – with Netflix and all the streamers and his idea is that you're basically going to get these big companies are going to be aggregating together and they're going to be creating their own content. You got to subscribe. It's, it's, it's not like the wild West, but the rules are changing a little bit. He said, but right now there's so much work and so many opportunities. Um, but like a show like that, I think would just be golden if they were on Netflix, uh, you know, you know, no restrictions at all. It would have been, uh, I, I thought it was great as it was. Don't get me wrong, but, uh, yeah, I, I know exactly what you're saying and there's no, uh, there's no offense going to be taken about that. Well, my daughter, I have yet to see it. I, I told my daughter, Lily, my 19 year old, I says watching, uh, I was going to be speaking with you. And she's like, Oh yeah, he's on made. I put that in the bank of shows. I'm still have yet to watch. There's so much stuff out there to catch up on. I said, well, I'm watching nine one one Lone Star. And she's like, so, okay, okay, okay. I'm watching that too. So we both have that in common. I'm going to watch made here shortly, but you, you're obviously staying busy, you know. So, nine one one that shot in it was supposed to be in Texas, shot in L.A. Um, yeah. Those kind of episodic things where you're coming in, um, and you know that you got an established team there. Is that is that ever uh, not uncomfortable? But is it 
is it something you're 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 comfortable stepping in? You got an established cast. You're coming in for an arc. Is that is that still cool for you, or you kind of prefer to be a you know one of the primary characters? Yeah, I, um, like I said on Twenty Four, when I stepped into that, I mean the machine had already been working so well, and everybody was gelling, and it was a really comfortable atmosphere. It, the difference in COVID times is vast. Okay, yeah. um, it is just you know if you allow it to the masks and the testing and all the stuff, it will suck the fucking joy right out of it, you know? So you've got to be, you know, you got to be mindful of, of that and put that caveat on it all the time. That said, you know, the first time I stepped onto the Lone Star set, I mean, just beautiful people all around, like such a lovely environment and their machine was running really, really well as well. Um, and and the character itself again i didn't really know where it was gonna go i had an idea you know they they talked about you know who he was and that there was going to be you know certain red herrings and and twists involved but the experience on that has been mostly that i've just had such a fun time with him you know he's a he's he's so unpredictable. I, I was about um, to say and, that you don't know kind of like okay this guy seems like he's, he's, the, that, I'm, I'm going all the way back to the other characters even the unpredictable go, even go back to 24 even still that's one of the things I love mm-hmm. and I really admire about your work is you do have that uh, your the, the uh, I put like a Gary Oldman or a uh, 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 um, Sam Rockwell people you just like to look at and watch and just watch him think. With no dialogue, they're just equally as interesting, and and you had plenty of opportunities in that you know where you're kind of like, how's he going to react? What's he going to say? Is he going to be the good guy? Like I said, it's 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 certainly fun to watch you. That's you know from well, a- first of all, thank you. That's good company. Um, Gary Oldman again, one of the, I mean, not only in the pantheon of greats, but uh, again, just a really super sweet, genuine guy. I. I did a movie with Gary Oldman. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, you know, that nobody, <laughs> that, I mean, some people saw, but uh, directed by Catherine Hardwick, who uh, who did the first Twilight movie. Oh, yeah, um, that's right. That's right. Yeah. It was, it was and, Red Riding Hood. That's, uh, that, it was okay. Red Riding Hood, yeah. Um, and, you know, it was what it was. But but I, I did a movie with Gary Oldman, and there it is. Yeah, that's something that bugs me. I, I was speaking to Ariel Vroma, and I, he directed him in, uh, with uh, Kevin Costner in Criminal. And I was like, I meant to ask one question I want to ask. Gary Oldman, what's it like to be directing him? And I'm like, oh, crap. And I'm like, two seconds later, I'm like, God damn, I forgot to ask that question. But kind of as we're uh, wrapping up here, and, and I appreciate you being so generous with your time, most certainly. But, sure. um, but you know, what I like to do is kind of wrap up whenever I talk with folks, the um, something called my Preston's Lucky Seven. I just like to throw out seven questions. I think it's kind of, Kind of a fun way to find out a little bit of insight beyond all the all the who is this like the actor studio thing? You know what? Uh, you know, I'm not going to say I'm nearly as eloquent as uh, as him, uh, but I'm also not going to go you know Barbara Walters and ask you what kind of tree you would be. So I'm not going to. Uh, but what what is first question? What's your favorite comfort food? The thing you just like, man, when it comes down to snacking, oh. or it's like when you're just chilling with it, you just got to you just okay. This is I'm going to chill at home and eat it. So easy. Um, uh, favorite food of all time is uh vietnamese soup some call it pho, pho yeah. but we know the per, per, I, I guess pho is right um but we still call it pho because it's more fun to say um <laughs> <laughs> uh so that's it yeah god i'm hungry right now now you're sitting there making me think it's like ah, we're trying to decide what to do with um yeah my kids i could eat it any time of day breakfast lunch dinner doesn't matter no, that's one thing I love watching Anthony Bourdain, and uh, he he was. I got turned on to the idea of eating something like that, but for breakfast, but have it be spicy. That's a, you know, in America we always have something sweet. But that's actually kind of a cool way to start the day. Like a hot soup is kind of spicy, you know, and a look and a cup of coffee after. I've but done it many times, my friend. <laughs> um, now, okay, next question: Three people. You're going to have a cup of coffee, and you're going to sit down with them. Uh, who would those three people be uh, for you? Uh, I always go back to music and and most of my, um, well, a lot of my favorites are, happen to be actors as well. Uh, Tom Waits. Oh, and, oh, indeed. Yeah. He's a great, both, both actor and, uh, and, uh, musician. 
you cover both. He's just a magical human being. I, 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 I want to hear I, a documentary I, I, that he narrates. I would love to hear a documentary come out. It just, I'd just be glued to it the entire time. Well, yeah. Anytime he opens his mouth, he's, it's just, it's, there's, there's poetry coming out. It's great. Um, so Tom Waits, uh, the late David Bowie would be on the list. Um, also a great actor in his right. I don't know. Speaking of vampires, by the way, oh, if indeed. kids out there haven't, uh, you know, if they're thirsting for some vampire movies and want to see no pun intended, one of the best, <laughs> one of the yes, one of the best vampire movies ever made, The Hunger, made back in I think seventy nine or eighty, uh, with uh, him and Susan Sarandon, and uh, it's it's so awesome. Anyway. So Tom and Dave, um, I guess the third one is gonna be Barack Obama for me. He's shown up a couple times. Uh, yeah, he's. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that people that have a story to tell, I think that would be, or or have a unique way of seeing the world. That's got to be the best people to sit down with. But also, he just seems like a fucking cool guy. You know, I like hanging out with cool people. Yeah, speaking of speaking relax. of, uh, I was talking about Anthony Bourdain a moment ago. Did you see that there was an episode where he happened to be in Vietnam, and and Obama mm-hmm. happened to be there at the same time. They connected and they sat down. They had a yeah. bowl of pho, and I'm like, yeah. I was like, you know, there's some things you can't fake. You can't fake a certain level of being that genuine, you know, and disarmed. I'm like that. He would be right. a lot of fun. I gotta put him on That's my list. Right. Um, now, okay, who's your celebrity crush when you were a kid? Uh, had several. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and you know, I, I think you and I are around the same age, mm-hmm. so um, this is going to date us both. But uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I was how old was I in the late seventies um, when Charlie's Angels was on? Um, you know, I was twelve. Yeah, something. Um, so, all the angels, pick a, pick one. Um, that was. I, I but, think but did you have the poster? Poster I had uh, the first poster I had was uh, was Cheryl Teague's. Oh, Cheryl Teague. Okay, okay. So I was going to go see. Uh, yeah. Farrah Fawcett has come up once already. Yeah, but she was like, she was. I mean, and God bless her. She was awesome and continued to be so awesome uh, after that show, but. Uh, I, I feel like even at that age, I felt that was too typical. I had to go, you know, in a slightly sideways direction. Yeah, right. so. <laughs> you and I think a lot alike. Okay, I like that. I like, yeah. I, you know, I haven't heard anybody say Olivia Newton John yet, but that was kind of she was up there. Uh, something that the Australian accent mixed in there was mesmerizing. As oh, a sure, young kid. <laughs> sure. I mean, I I can see that. I guess you know when Greece came out, that was uh, that would have been a direction to move in as a kid my age, but. Uh, Probably, probably too wholesome for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, you know, I, I, again, we have a lot in common. Uh, now, next question is: um, uh, you okay? You get up morning. Definition of a perfect day for you? It's just like, all right, this is how I want to live my day, and everything smooth as silk, man. It goes perfectly for you. Um. Well, first of all, I I would prefer to have. Um, you know, something, even though I don't like schedules, I would prefer to have something that day that had to get done so that I knew that I had to, but, you know, let's face it in this life, most days are, are not like that. So I would say on a perfect day and I live in New York now, so this isn't really, um, that possible, especially with the weather recently, I would get up, get on my motorcycle, go for a ride, go have some pho, pho, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, come back, uh, and start fiddling on guitar and, um, and then, probably help my daughter finish homework and uh hang out with her a little bit and uh that would be it 
And she's in, she's going to school in New York. She is now. Yeah, that's a, one one hell of an interesting. Pl- everybody I've ever talked to or know that uh, musician or you know, anybody grew grew up in New York. It's 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 definitely an ecosystem, an interesting place for a kid to kind of you know take in stuff. So you know, yeah. I, I was a suburban kid in North Dallas growing up, so it's it's definitely intriguing to me to be like, well, what's that experience like for a kid? You know? Yeah, I was such a uh, you know sort of suburban but you know washington state's weird it's you know i always consider myself uh, coming from you know the the roots of a little bit of white trashness just that sort of you know, <laughs> you know that sort of i mean we i actually did live in that world where uh, i don't care where you go just be back at a certain time and mm. uh, i mean i had a lot of freedom as a kid you can't have that with your kid here oh, in New York yeah. City. It just doesn't it, happen. Yeah. It, 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 I never remember my parents saying the same thing to me to a degree. But, man, I, 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 the freedom I had uh, and, I, and and to even think about my kids going to my son driving, it, I trust my kids implicitly, but it's, it's everybody else that I got to, you know. You, you sure. see other, pe- there, the other people out there in the world that you don't know. And, you know, it's uh, one thing to trust your kid, but... Man, I tell you. By the way, to make the motorcycle analogy, it's the same thing with a motorcycle. I trust myself. I'm fine. I'm going to be fine. It's all the it's all the other fuckers out there who are like who are not paying attention. You know. Yeah, I. You know what? I I've always been intrigued at the motorcycle thing. Now, I did learn how to fly, but I, I kind of felt like I got a lot of space between me and other people, and it's controlled space. You know. But you and Keanu Reeves got got you know. I think he's probably living that dream of loving bikes, making his own. I mean, that's kind of cool. Um, yeah. That's pretty cool. Now, last two questions. You're both musician and actor. Desert Island, one year, you're taking one album, one DVD. What are you going to bring with you that you're just not going to tire of? You're going to be cool watching it over and over, listening to it over and over again. Uh, that's one album, one DVD, right? Yes, sir. Um, I know this is kind of like a the, Sophie's Choice for you. I know that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the the album is going to be a toss up between um, between <sighs> Elton John's greatest hits back in the seventies, not mm-hmm. the later ones. The very first greatest hits album, um, and uh, and probably. Tom Waits, Small Change. Uh, those would be the two top that I would have to wrestle with while I'm on the island. Right. I'd have to throw one away, but uh, but I'll, I'll I'll take both and uh, throw one in the fucking ocean if I have to. <laughs> um, the uh, the top DVD, the movie. Yes, right? sir. Yeah. Well, my lifelong number one has always been Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, um, but. At this point, I've seen it so many times that I wouldn't need to bring it with me so I can keep that in my memory. Um, uh, oddly, the other movie that sticks out in my mind is my... I, I've got a lot of favorite movies, obviously, but the one that sticks in my mind in recent years that I just think is genius in so many ways is Blue Valentine. Really? Yeah. I think that's one of the most honest depictions of a relationship I've ever seen in a motion picture. God, I'm, I'm, I'm brain farting on the actor. Um, that's Gosling and yeah. um, uh, and why am I blanking on her name? We all well, know who she is. I, I've uh, always done this thing where I try to remember a name. I mean, I, get, I mean, it's, it's like I've been out hanging out with people. And my brain goes, "Oh, you're trying to access that name, are you? <laughs> no, you're not." Mm-hmm. Yeah, but Gosling, he is such. He's another guy. He's just kind of fun, just to kind of watch. Like just kind of his, um, his just when he yeah. and Steve Carell were in that uh, that. Oh, it's magic. You know, his just his uh, his physicality. Just the guy. Just all right. This is who he's going to be, and then he disarms yeah. for Steve Carell's, you know, daughter. That's a another movie I've seen a jillion times. Um, yeah, Carell's another one of those guys who just he's uh, he's just so unique and so uh, uh i just appreciate him so much oh and both on both in dramatic both uh that and comedy most most certainly 
you know, anything Judd Apatow's done with him in it, I'm, I'm just going to put that on like a big DVD set and bring that to the island. With, with the 40-year-old me. virgin changed the – it absolutely changed the game of adult comedies. Did it not? It, right? It, it, we yeah, I was talking about – landscape, and all of a sudden that came out, and then it was like, oh, it's okay to make this movie again. Again, yeah. Like, we need – and yeah. and, it, and it's kind of gone away a little bit. It needs to come back again, I think. I think Judd Apatow yeah. needs to get out there making more of those movies. Just, that's absurdly funny adult, rated R movies that I miss, yeah, you know, the kind of movies that I, you know, that made me want to be in the, that not to, you know, they weren't as extreme back then, but you know, all the best stuff, music and movies were, was made in the seventies, by the way. Um, so, you know, the smoking, the bandits and cannonball runs and, you know, those kind of pictures made for adults oh the best the best part of those movies were the outtakes the best part i remember you being a kid my parents were so taking great. the movies i probably shouldn't have gone to uh but i was like the smoking to i mean uh, burt reynolds was just who he was especially when he was married to lonnie anderson he was just like on fire there was he was his own like thing i don't know if there's anybody been as bigger in that time oh and you should really like go back and and look at some uh, YouTube, some uh, some interviews with him and Johnny Carson. Uh, I mean, there was nobody doing what he did. There was nobody who had the abandon that this guy had. He was like when he showed up on a panel on Carson. Yep, I'm a movie star. Yeah, it was it was that was just it was kind of like he's, he was kind of like fuck you. You know who I am. I'm going to come here have some fun with you. He was the reason. Yeah, when I was a kid, he was the reason. When I saw Smoking the Bandit for the first time, he was the re. I just I, I looked at that movie and I looked at him and I was like, that guy's having way too much fun. I want to do that. Yeah, and I identify so, with Jerry yeah. Reed a lot. I mean, the guy and his dog. Just, yeah. <laughs> it was so awesome. Yeah. Um, well, uh, last question here. Uh, you got you, you jump into DeLorean. You're cruising back to when you're 16. What piece of advice and guidance are you thinking? I needed to hear that when I was 16, so I'm gonna zip back and tell myself that. Um, well, let's establish first that, uh, I, I don't live with laments or regrets. Um, but, um, I, I probably would have told myself to be less, I don't know if I can encapsulate this in a word. So let's just say as my life and career have gone on, I could have made choices that would have put me in a different place. Um, easy choices for other people to make, um, but for me, we're just not the right choice. Um, I, I don't do well at self-promotion. I don't do well at, um, at, you know, like this right now that we're doing, it's cool because we're just talking and that's fine, you know? And so I guess the advice that I would have given myself is that, uh, you know, maybe be more open to things that could perhaps give you more, more and different opportunities as opposed to shunning them because you don't want to <laughs> do them. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, yeah. I don't, I, I, I'm the same way. You can't really live with regrets, but it's, uh, it, it's one of those things where if you're enjoying where you're at now, it took all those screw ups and success. I mean, you learn, you know, you know, they say something, I'm going to mess up the quote. They say, uh, a captain doesn't learn how to be a captain in calm seas, you know, and that kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, but no, man, my friend, uh, I appreciate you being so generous with your time and I'm glad we had a chance to, uh, to, uh, to connect. Uh, one last question. What do you got? What's, what's up next? Anything on the, uh, in the pipeline that's going to be coming out soon or, um, nothing coming out soon. We're actually, as we speak right now, as I'm, um, uh, as soon as I get off this uh, podcast with you, I'm uh, going to be talking to the team. We're in negotiations for uh, for something right now, um, so we'll see what happens. Um, but uh, yeah, but there's nothing in the pipeline right now that's gonna that's uh, that's about to come out. Well, very cool, my friend. Uh, I'll keep my fingers crossed for it to be a good thing for you. Thank you. Well, there you go. Billy Burke. Pretty cool guy, huh? Uh, I tell you, he's he's one of my favorite working actors. He is one of those guys you see show up and you're, you're just glad to see him. Okay, tell you what, uh, don't forget, Story and Craft Pod 
storyandcraftpod.com. Head to the site once again, storyandcraftpod.com. All the social media goodness is there. And uh, don't forget to like and subscribe and all that kind of fun stuff to the show. Um, Next week, another great show. Going to have a great chat and I hope you're part of it. I know it's a new show and I thank you so much for taking the time to check it out. And of course, if you want to shoot off a note and say howdy and uh, just kind of give your feedback, by all means, shoot an email to hello at storyandcraftpod.com. And uh, once again, I'm Mark Preston and I will check you next time right here on Story and Craft. That's it for this episode of Story and Craft. Join Mark next week for more conversation right here on Story and Craft. Story and Craft is a presentation of Mark Preston Productions, LLC. Executive producer is Mark Preston. Associate producer is Zachary Holden. Please rate and review Story and Craft on Apple Podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. You can subscribe to show updates and stay in the know. Just head to storyandcraftpod.com and sign up for the newsletter. I'm Emma Dillon. See you next time. And remember, keep telling your story. Come on.